Jerry Saul on how a virtual mannequin instructor did this problem solving. Okay. Um, so this is about a structural analysis of what I call group cognition or inter collaborative interaction. Um, and so the, 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 the fundamental question that I want to address is how does cognition take place in a CSCL setting? I think it's obvious that this is a fundamental question for uh, CSCL research. Uh, in particular, by cognition, I have a concept of group cognition, which I'll explain somewhat in, in this talk. And um, how does it take place, and how can it be analyzed, of course, by researchers? So this is a, the overview of my talk. I want to start out quickly uh, presenting a hierarchy of levels that can be analyzed in collaborative learning. I think it's a natural hierarchy. Uh, and then, and then um, look at one level within that hierarchy that I think is particularly key to understanding, uh, understanding collaborative learning, how it works, uh, and do uh, an analysis of the sequential structure, how, how, this, how the collaborative learning unfolds sequentially in time. Uh, in the discourse, and in particular in math discourse for the case study we're doing. So it's built around, the talk is built around the case study of collaborative learning online of math students in uh, the project virtual math teams that I uh, directed. And in particular, I'm going to look at a sequence of 10 what I call discourse moves. And, and, and look at that structure and see how, how this group of students solves the math problem that they're, that they're working on uh, through this sequence of 10 moves. So we'll see 10 very short chat excerpts that are sequential. They come one after another continuously. And then I'll reflect a bit of, about what this uh, tells us about group cognition in, in the field of mathematics in particular. So here's the hierarchy of the levels of analysis uh, that I've been working with recently. So we have a group at the highest level, uh, an event at the highest level. The event in this case was a four hour long um, collaboration of several students, four students working online. It was four hours long but in one hour segments on different days. So over a two week period they met four times. That's the whole, and it was um, what we called a spring fest, where we invited students from all around the world to come. We put them in groups online. They had never met. They never met. All they know about each other is what they see in the chat. Um, so within that event, there's the different sessions. So there's the four different sessions. So that's another level. Uh, each session, they go over different topics. So one could look at the conversational topics. And in here, um, this idea of a longer sequence is what I'm going to focus on in today's talk. Uh, and the sequence is built on discourse moves that you can, you can pick out. And, in con and the whole talk is built, on, built, analyt built uh, methodologically on conversation analysis. Uh, and conversation analysis typically focuses on what they call adjacency pairs, and I'll define that. So the next lower level would be to look at uh, adjacency, individual adjacency pairs, which is where one student responds to another. Uh, so it's something like a question-answer sequence would be the, the pair of question and answer response would be an adjacency pair. So obviously an adjacency pair consists of a couple um, utterances, and within an utterance or a chat posting, uh, you can identify various uh, references to different things. Um, and so those are different levels in which you can analyze uh, the structure of a collaborative event. Uh, so I want to look at uh, the issue of intersubjectivity in particular. 
uh, which is often discussed in terms of common ground. The, the, the problem of intersubjectivity is how do people who are working together, how do they understand each other or how do they understand uh, the same thing when somebody says, uh, you know, look at this hexagon. How does somebody else know that uh, they're talking about the same hexagon or the same thing when they use the term hexagon? So, so how do people understand each other? Um, it's a complicated issue, and I want to look at that. Um, so what's called common ground is what people share in terms of their understanding of things, like their understanding of mathematical concepts and so on. Uh, and it, it includes the fact that as humans we have a huge amount of tacit understanding uh, of the world that we've learned since we were born. Um, and in addition to that, there's explicit uh, issues of explicit understanding about, for instance, new, 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 new um, concepts that we haven't heard before and we need to learn what they mean and what other people mean by them. The, the uh, issue of common ground usually addresses the latter point, that is, uh, new, new concepts. Um, and philosophical investigations of intersubjectivity uh, generally address the, the tacit background knowledge point. But they, they both are needed to, to have intersubject, intersubjective understanding. In particular, there's a concept of uh, longer sequences. So I said con in conversation analysis, um, they've traditionally focused on these adjacency pairs. Um, but, it, but that's interesting from sort of a linguistic viewpoint, how people respond to each other. But if you want to understand collaborative learning, I think you have to look at this next step up in the hierarchy I went through, which is longer sequences. And the leading figures in conversation analysis have sort of recognized this and mentioned the idea of longer sequences. But nobody, as far as I know, has analyzed longer sequences in a conversation analytic way. And that's what I try to do in this paper. Um, so these longer sequences are somewhere between the adjacency pairs that are traditional in conversation analysis and, and the more um, uh, higher level uh, topics that discourse analysis uh, looks at, such as politi um, uh, political issues of, about people's uh, relationships to each other. So it's a it's, um, larger unit of analysis than individual utterances or adjacency pairs, but smaller than a person's identity issues or ideological issues. And so I've been trying to develop a science of this level of analysis, and this is a contribution to that. Uh, so as I said, people like Sachs, who's the real founder of conversation analysis, and Shegloff in his relatively recent book, which he uh, really provides a nice summary of the findings of conversation analysis, they mention this topic of longer sequences but they never do uh, much analysis of it. Furthermore, uh, conversation analysis as a field, which has grown to be quite a, quite a substantial uh, research field, is traditionally focused on adult American face-to-face -face informal conversation. So if we want to apply something like that to, to chat among students talking about a domain like mathematics in a, in a text chat environment, uh, we need to do some adaptation of the methodology. Um, so I tried to do that in my work, and also now to extend it from the adjacency pair level of analysis to these longer sequences, which I feel really accomplish the cognitive tasks that groups work on. And so I'm working in uh, this environment. This is the online environment that the students met in, and it's basically you know, a standard kind of chat, text chat, uh, with the shared whiteboard, where they can do freehand drawings and put little squares and color them in and have text uh, squares. So um, this is actually uh, part of the chat that we're going to analyze. 
and they're working on a problem that involves this sort of diamond pattern composed of squares. And they're, they're, so the mathematical question they've been working on um, is if, if you have a sequence that grows, say, from this diamond shape to this bigger one and so on, how many squares does it take to make up the pattern? And how many individual lines does it take as the pattern grows? So they've been working on this for a while. And then they've, they've also mentioned, they've also developed some of their own uh, similar kinds of problems to work on. Uh, and the interesting thing for this pattern, is, and this is something that I hadn't thought of, and this group of students uh, taught me to look at it this way, is uh, you, can, you can divide the, you can look at just the vertical lines, if you're counting the lines, or just the horizontal lines. And there's an additional, and they're identical, the count. Uh, and in addition, there's a, an additional symmetry so all the blue ones is the mirror image of the yellow ones and so on. So if you just pick the lines of one color and count them up, or have a formula for it, multiply by four, you get the, sum, the total number. And that's what they do. But what I want to look at here is, is ha so I've looked at the chat. I've broken it into segments like this one. And in each segment, what I discovered was that you can see an adjacency pair. So, and I've put them in boldface. So here, one student named Wang says, I think we're very close to solving the problem here. Uh, and then another student says, well, one student has to leave. But a, a third student says, we can solve on that topic. So um, here they're selecting a problem that they haven't gotten to, a, a sub-problem of the larger mathematical work. And one person proposes that they should work on this, and another one accepts it. Um, so, and then the next step is they decide to start. So one person says, well, do you want to solve this problem? And the other person agrees. So a question and a response, and it's a decision to start through that adjacency pair. Here they pick an approach, which is, here's the fourfold symmetry. They know that they can, if they add them up and multiply by four, so that's going to be their approach based on what they've done before. Uh, here is, they start to identify the pattern in, in a narrative way, which then they'll translate, in, and that's based on a, a graphical view of things, and then they'll translate that into an uh, algebraic view. But anyway, uh, one person proposes or questions, is this the pattern, and then the other agrees. Uh, here they're seeking the equation. One says, well, let's find the equation. Mm -hmm. The other side agrees that that's what they should work on. Uh, they negotiate, is it this? Um, yes, it is, but that means something else was wrong. Then they uh, check some cases, and then they're, uh, they're very excited because they found the answer and they recognize it. So that's their aha moment in math, which is very uh, engaging. And then they uh, say, well, we're going to present this as a formal solution on the wiki that's going to be shared with the other groups that are in this uh, event. And then they decide they want to meet, meet again outside of this uh, setting to talk about math some more. So um, the point is that um, we've tried to find a sequential structure and found that this, the longer sequence is a series of 10, uh, ten discourse moves and each of the moves can be seen to be based on an adjacency pair in this conversation analysis way. And together, uh, this sequence accomplishes their, pr their problem, their cognitive problem that the group works on. They solve the problem, as you saw, through the set of 10 adjacency pair moves. Um, and so that I, can, I conclude that this is an, an example uh, in which we can see the longer sequence and how it's built interactionally and what its structure is, namely a sequence of simple moves with adjacency pairs. Uh, here's the moves that they went through. Um, so they solved a problem which had eluded their own work, their, their own group for several hours of thinking about it. 
it had eluded other groups. Another group thought they had an answer, but this group f figured out that their answer was, the other group's answer was wrong. So they did some, some really important mathematic and impressive mathematical work that none of them could have done alone. It was done by the group through their interaction. Um, and, this, and the analysis of that interaction was this longer sequence. Uh, each move was a very mundane, everyday thing. Uh, you saw there was nothing really profound about the individual move. But together, by going through the sequence of 10, they learned to solve this problem that, as I say, none of them could have done themselves. Um, and, and now, presumably, they can internalize it and they can do individual math solving by following a si similar sequence. And if you look at that sequence of 10 moves, in fact, it's a typical way that, that you probably solve math problems. You probably go through most of those steps as an individual because you've, because you've gotten to the point which is beyond their point. This is where they learned how to do that. Um, and so if you, look, if you look at the full paper, uh, you can see the meaning making that, they, that, goes, that takes place here and how they uh, uh, make if eventually this algebraic expression becomes meaningful for them through that uh, longer sequence. Um, so in conclusion, I guess, um, I think this is the first detailed analysis that I know of, of longer sequences which I think are fundamental to understanding uh, small group interaction and collaborative learning in an online setting. And the, paper, the full paper is available here, and these slides are available here. Any questions? Uh, I hope there are questions. <laughs> Comments? Yes? Basically, I take the same approach as their interaction analysis, and um, I work this out uh, largely through a, uh, a group process of our research group, which is what they recommend. Um, I can't think offhand what the term is, uh, but um, so the analysis process is a group process, just like the students had a group process, and uh, we we look line by line at the uh, interaction and discuss how we see it unfolding. So yeah, the, there's this paper, <coughs> famous paper, I think it's from the Journal of Learning Sciences from uh, 07 or something uh, by George, uh, Henders, Henderson and... Thank you. About interaction analysis. And it's quite a lengthy paper and a really nice uh, tutorial. Um, they, they, they talk about video analysis. Um, and so here you don't need video, so that eliminates a number of the steps involved. Um, they also don't involve all the steps. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, so the, the fact that we can now capture everything in an online system like this when we do CSCL work uh, is, is really an incredible opportunity for doing this kind of analysis because uh, it eliminates all the issues about the bit about transcribing video and so on. Um, I, I'm wondering how the, you pick some utterances out of a lot of utterances as constituting the, um, the extended, extended problem solving sequence. Um, so how do you pick that out? And of course I, I see a tension between the, uh, the ethnomethodology CA approach of only validating what the participants themselves validate the and paper, applying your, math, in the paper, your knowledge of math. In the paper, I argue that that um, um, uh, parsing it into discourse moves is based on the participants' understanding of what they're doing, not on my external. 
and you'd have to read the paper to see that. I can't, <laughs> I can't remember the argument in detail. I'm going to have to go through each, yeah. each one. Uh, but in terms of um, traditional, um, a traditional research question of inner, inner uh, subject, inner greater reliability, um, Carolyn Rose, who's uh, a, a leading uh, linguistic analyst at, at CMU, uh, looking at CSCL, happened to look at the same uh, excerpt from her own trying to do a completely different kind of analysis um, and came up with the same segmentation. Virtually mm, identical. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> ah, interesting. Yeah. Yep. And when you analyze the group conversation, you propose the hierarchy of the structure layers of uh, uh, collaborative knowledge building or meaning making. How do you uh, uh, identify these different structures? Yeah, I, so I would argue, and again, I don't have time to do that right now. Um, but th that this hierarchy is, is, is kind of a natural hierarchy, um, and, th and that um, the participants would recognize these levels. Obviously, they recognize the group. They volunteered to be part of this event. And they know that it consists of four sessions. So, you know, that's not being imposed by the analyst. Um, and then they open, they open the, in conversation analysis, there's this concept of opening a topic, opening and closing. And there are certain things that you do conversationally to open and close topics. So you can see uh, each of the topics being opened and closed by the participants. So it's not, again, it's not being imposed by me. Uh, the adjacency pairs, that's a basic, uh, you know, you'd have, to, you'd have to say conversation analysis isn't following the strictures of that methodology if you, if you didn't accept that as a layer. Uh, and I don't think many people would really do that. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, actually, you can take one more question. I can invite Bert Sloff to set up his presentation. Are there any other questions for Jerry while we set up? Uh, I like that. And uh, just now you analyzed the uh, uh, conversation in the asynchronous discussions. Right. Can we use uh, your structure in to analyze the asynchronous discussions? I don't know, but you're welcome to try it. <laughs> See, I think, I think that um, in CSCL, it's very important, uh, like Dan just mentioned, I don't know if people heard, that uh, the, the concept of multivocality, of uh, different researchers looking at the same data from different perspectives. And I think it's tremendously important to do. But as one person, as one individual researcher, I try to focus, and I focus on synchronous math, yeah. small group, one line. Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thanks.